The Associated Press reported the address would be brief. To hear it, Washington City was besieged. Hotels overflowed. The day of the speech, Saturday, March 4, 1865, dawned with steady rain. Streets oozed with mud. Like a shroud, fog wrapped its gray arms around the city. At 11.40 that morning, the rain suddenly ended. Above, turning, twisting, and racing clouds revealed patches of blue. Finally, on a wooden platform before the east portico of the Capitol building, the 16th president was introduced. He rose from his chair, put on his steel-rimmed eyeglasses, and stepped forward to speak. In his left hand, a copy of his inaugural address. It was his second. With a nation weary of civil war, with a population hoping for peace, and before an expectant crowd that needed a soothing message, he began. And as he did, the sun broke through the clouds. This is the story about what he said. His second inaugural address. And despite what you may think, the one he truly believed was his greatest. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. The speech contains 703 words, 25 sentences, and four paragraphs. Within, 505 one-syllable words. It was read slowly, barely more than 100 words a minute. As always, when the orator began, nervousness pushed his delivery to a high-pitched tenor. However, two or three sentences in, he relaxed and his voice deepened. The text required about seven minutes. The 16th President of the United States regarded this speech, his second inaugural address, not the one at Gettysburg, the best he ever gave. Historians agree. During his presidency, Abraham Lincoln had constantly wrestled with the issue of civil war, both nationally and personally. For him, it was a constant battle between the Constitution and the issue of slavery, an institution made legal by the very document he had sworn to defend. Yet, by the spring of 1865, he was at peace with the course he had taken and with himself, and his address reflected just that. On Friday, March the 3rd, there was much in motion that made his life exciting and perilous. The Confederacy was on its last legs, and many feared Southern desperation might lead to the President's abduction or assassination. All roads to Washington City were heavily picketed, all bridges heavily patrolled. Plain-clothed detectives roamed streets that were filled with large numbers of Confederate deserters. In that personally chaotic world, he made final preparations for his second inaugural address. He had hinted to others his speech would be brief. Politicians and citizens wondered what he would say. Would he chastise the South? Would he treat them as a conquered people? What would happen with slavery? A good portion of his first inaugural address argued that constitutionally speaking as he understood it, the Union could not be dissolved. Four years to the day later, this oration addressed expected victory, but also a war weariness that bore testament to the fact that one of every 11 who served would die. This address would also establish that he intended to not only win the war, but win the peace. Anticipating his remarks and the ceremonies, crowds of people inundated the capital. In the 13th most populated city in the Union, trains unloaded multitudes who arrived from everywhere. Hotels were forced to place cots in halls and parlors. 
Even firehouses within the city offered sleeping spaces. They came despite early March winds and constant rain and found disorder, seas of mud, and a capitol building with a newly completed iron dome. And there was something else, constant reminders that the nation was nearing its fourth year of civil war. Indeed, Washington City was one gigantic hospital. The night before, Friday the 3rd, Bands and surging masses of people, many inebriated, pushed and shoved their way through fog-shrouded streets. Though the mood was celebratory, the president was hard at work. He was with his cabinet until late that evening. Congress was busy, too, trying to wrap up the business of the 38th Congress. Dawn, the next morning, was muted, for there was constant rain. The deluge turned Washington City into a quagmire, soft, soupy mud that resembled black plaster. The Army Corps of Engineers tried to lay pontoons down the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue, stretching all the way from the Capitol to the Executive Mansion, but the muddy bottoms couldn't hold anchors. And adding to the misery, gale-like winds in the early morning hours uprooted trees. It was an unlikely setting for a presidential inauguration. Around 7 a.m. that Saturday morning, the Senate and House finally adjourned. Around 9.30, the rain stopped, and about an hour later, the sky started to clear. And yet, around 10.40, more clouds rolled in and there was more torrential rain. Unpaved avenues bobbed in some 10 inches of mud. It seemed that men in uniform were everywhere, and many, interestingly enough, were African American. And amongst the crowds, many black citizens. So much so that the Times of London estimated that at least half the multitude were colored people. Around mid-morning, Grand Marshal Ward Hill Lehman began to pull the scattered elements of the inaugural parade together. At 11 a.m., the procession lurched forward from the corner of Pennsylvania Avenue and 10th Street. Out in front, 119 Metropolitan policemen. Union soldiers were right behind. Then, volunteer firemen, a company from Philadelphia, one from Chicago, and another from Washington City. Down the parade line, four companies of the 45th United States Colored Regiment. Then came floats. Special marshals and the president's Union Light Guard escorted Mrs. Lincoln. The president was conspicuously absent. He was still in the Capitol, signing bills. Despite the dismal weather, things went fairly smoothly until a traffic snarl created by horses, troops, firemen, and their fire engines brought the parade to a halt. After 20 minutes of waiting, an impatient Mary Todd Lincoln left her carriage and proceeded by a back way. Finally, the entourage began to move again, but without the president and his first lady. Inside the U.S. Senate chamber, doors opened at 10 a.m. and spectators scrambled for available seats. Inside, a who's who of important figures. Visitors gawked at Union Major General Joseph Hooker and Admiral David Farragut. They oohed and awed at the colorful dress worn by the diplomatic corps. At 11.45, the official procession began. Walking in together into the Senate chamber, the outgoing Vice President Hannibal Hamlin and the new second-in-command Andrew Johnson Some wondered why an unsteady Johnson leaned so heavily on Hamlin's arm. At noon, the gentleman from Maine began his farewell address. In truth, Hamlin's tenure as vice president had been uneventful. Added to the 1860 Republican ticket to appease abolitionists, Lincoln, during his first term, rarely conferred with him. So little that Hamlin spent most of his time away from the Capitol. 
While Hamlin spoke, the president was off in a side room near the Senate chamber, still signing bills. Hamlin's address was repeatedly interrupted by the late arrival of Secretary of State William Seward and the rest of the cabinet. Then again, when Chief Justice Salomon Chase and his eight associate justices entered. While the outgoing vice president paused to allow the Supreme Court justices to take their seats, Hamlin was asked to politely ask the women in the gallery to stop their disrespectful giggling and chatter. He did, but was ignored. Returning to his remarks, there was yet another interruption as Mrs. Lincoln entered the chamber. When Hamlin finally finished, the new vice president, the native of Raleigh, North Carolina, and military governor of Tennessee, Andrew Johnson, was introduced. Just as he began his address, the president arrived. From Johnson's demeanor and delivery, others quickly picked up that the vice president was not well. In fact, he had not been for weeks, and his journey from Nashville to Washington City had not helped. That morning, feeling unsteady, he asked for and took a shot of whiskey to bolster him. He had another on the way to the Senate. Then another. Barely into his first sentence, all to their horror, realized Andrew Johnson was drunk. Not surprisingly, his speech rambled. Shocked were guests and dignitaries. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells sat with his eyes closed. The new vice president was to speak seven minutes. Into his 17th minute, Hamlin tugged at Johnson's coattails, and that helped to end the embarrassment. Although Johnson heightened everyone's discomfort when he slurred through the oath of office. Then, with hand on the Bible, he blurted, I kiss this book in the face of my nation of the United States. A sloppy kiss then followed. To inaugural Marshal Missouri Senator John B. Henderson, the president said, Do not let Johnson speak outside. At 11.40, the rain suddenly stopped. Lincoln left the Senate chamber by way of a corridor and moved to a wooden platform which had been erected in front of the eastern portico of the Capitol. There, photographer Alexander Gardner prepared to capture the only image of Abraham Lincoln while giving a speech. Out on the platform, Lincoln was introduced and the massive audience erupted. Then, Senate Sergeant-at-Arms George T. Brown of Illinois rose and bowed with a black hat in hand, the signal to ask the crowd to quieten down. When they did, Lincoln rose from his seat, moved to a white iron table, the only piece of furniture present, on it a tumbler of water. As he moved forward, he spotted out in front Frederick Douglass, an unknown to him, to his left and behind a buttress, 26-year-old actor John Wilkes Booth. No doubt, in the last seconds before he began his second inaugural address, his mind drifted back four years to the day when he delivered his first. His speech that day was one he had shared with many before it was presented. Back in February and March of 1861, Lincoln had asked feedback from many. All, for the most part, commended Mr. Lincoln for his effort. Yet in Washington City, his new Secretary of State, New York's William Seward, read the address and returned a six-page letter filled with suggestions and comments, entitled General Remarks. Seward praised Lincoln's reasoning as strong and conclusive. Yet he strongly suggested much should be included to remove prejudice and passion in the South, despondency and fear in the East. And so, Seward made 49 suggestions. Lincoln incorporated 27. Most of them came in Lincoln's last paragraphs. Though influenced by Seward's remarks, Mr. Lincoln put his own stamp on several of Seward's suggestions. 
Here, a few examples. Seward suggested, I close. Lincoln used, I am loath to close. Seward suggested, we are not, we must not be aliens or enemies, but fellow countrymen and brethren. Mr. Lincoln chose, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Seward suggested, although passion has strained our bonds of affection too hardly, they must not, I am sure they will not, be broken. Mr. Lincoln used, though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And Seward suggested, the mystic chords which proceeding from so many battlefields and so many patriot graves pass through all the hearts and all the hearths in this broad continent of ours will yet again harmonize in their ancient music when breathed upon by the guardian angel of the nation. Mr. Lincoln chose, the mystic chords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. In the revisions, note Lincoln's talent as a wordsmith. He tightened and softened Seward's prose. He got rid of repeated words and he achieved brevity and precision. He also used one of his favorite tactics, alliteration. In that collaborative first inaugural address, his message was one of intellect and logic. He spoke of constitutional rights and responsibilities. Like a lawyer arguing a case, he gave evidence to support his position. On this March 4th, the president prepared to deliver a speech that we believe was written without help, without suggestions from another. And so, as we earlier mentioned, Lincoln rose, put on and adjusted his steel-rimmed eyeglasses. As he moved forward, he held his speech in his left hand. It was printed in two columns, the handwritten draft set in type. The galley proof clipped and pasted to help him with pauses for emphasis and breathing. Incredibly, precisely as he began to speak, the sun broke through the clouds. Here's his first paragraph. At this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. Then, a statement somewhat in detail of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now, at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. It is interesting that the President chose to open this way at this second appearing, because he almost did not appear. Only three months before, Lincoln believed he would be defeated in his bid for re-election, politically battered by the 2,000-a-day casualties suffered in U.S. Grant's overland campaign in Virginia. There were many who were war-weary, so much so that in August of that year, the chairman of the Republican National Convention, Henry J. Raymond, canvassed Republican members and found that if the election were to be held now in Illinois, we should be beaten. Yet David Farragut's August victory at Mobile Bay and William Sherman's capture of Atlanta in early September provided the impetus for Lincoln's re-election, the first chief executive to be re-elected in 32 years. 
Lincoln began his address in a subdued fashion, and he did so intentionally. He wanted to tone down the highly charged atmosphere of wartime Washington City, and to do so, he did more than address his audience in unemotional fashion. Ever the wordsmith, he chose appropriate words. In the first, third, and fifth sentence of the first paragraph, he chose words to lower expectations. He used words like less, little, no. He minimized his own role in all of this by using only two personal pronouns, myself and I. He made clear that he offered no prediction about the end of the war. His audience may well have wanted a rousing rally round the flag message, but Mr. Lincoln did not comply. By design, he did not use stylistic flourishes. He chose words that did not create passion. In quite honestly an awkward and ungraceful fashion, Lincoln was paving the way for what was coming. And so, with that crafted foundation, the second paragraph began on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago. In the first paragraph, Lincoln mentioned everything he would not address. Now in the second, he shifted in content and tone, and addressing historical causation did so in a conversational manner. In 99 words, he asked his audience to think about the cause and the meaning of this civil war. Here, the second paragraph. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. In this second paragraph, the President used all and both to include North and South all thoughts were anxiously directed. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. Both parties deprecated war. In recalling events from the first inauguration, he used antithesis, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, seeking to destroy it without war. One of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. In this paragraph, Lincoln was partisan. However, that being said, he continued to use words that did not incite. Instead of rebels or traitors, he spoke of insurgent agents. And using the word war seven times, he suggested neither side was in control. And again, he used his already favorite tactic alliteration, directed, dreaded, delivered, devoted, destroy, dissolve, divide, and deprecated. He used alliteration in every sentence of the paragraph, but the four-word last one, and that one served as transition for his third paragraph, and the war came. Four words in all one-word syllables. He reinforced that civil war came in spite of the best intentions and did so to hammer home that it had its own life. His third paragraph opened with one-eighth of the whole population. This section or paragraph used 394 of the 703-word address. Within, he advanced from the second paragraph's historical theme to theological and political themes. With the last four sentences of the second paragraph and initial seven of the third, the president spoke of the past. Now he turned to the present and future. Here, the third paragraph. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves. 
not distributed generally over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union even by war while the government claimed no right to do more than restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and the result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether." It was in this paragraph that Lincoln used reason and emotion. He discussed the issue of slavery and its relation to the war, and did so in muted language. To offer comparison, I offer the words of abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who in 1831, in the first edition of his The Liberator, wrote, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. Note that each phrase begins with I, very much in your face. The 16th president believed Garrison and the abolitionists sabotaged their objectives by using strong language that alienated the uncommitted. Lincoln himself was tempted to use this direct style a decade earlier, but realized that then slavery was protected by the Constitution. And he maintained this handcuffed philosophy in subsequent policies when he became president. And that indeed enraged the likes of Garrison, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, Frederick Douglass, and novelist Harriet Beecher Stowe. It is also interesting to note that the word Constitution is never used in the second inaugural address, although he recognized, as he put it, I could not take the office without taking the oath to defend it. And the president went on to admit, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events controlled me. And that simple admission he acknowledged his political journey, and to some, his plotted course to emancipation. Within this third paragraph, Mr. Lincoln also observed that both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. Before Abraham Lincoln, 
18 inaugural addresses had been given by 14 men. Each had referred to God or the deity. George Washington spoke of the parent of the human race. John Adams called upon the patron of order. Thomas Jefferson mentioned an infinite power in James Madison, an almighty being. Both James Monroe and John Quincy Adams called upon Almighty God, James Buchanan, a divine providence. Usually their mention was in their last paragraph, not this day, before only one president actually quoted scripture, and that was John Quincy Adams. In the Psalm 340 words that make up the rest of Lincoln's third paragraph, beginning with the phrase, both read the same Bible, Lincoln quoted or paraphrased four biblical passages from Psalms, Hebrews, Genesis, and Matthew. And he invoked the word prayer three times. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. The prayers of both could not be answered. And fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray. He used these divine references because he knew his audience would relate. He did so despite the fact that he was not a member of any church. But this president, with ongoing national and personal tragedy, reflected on his relationship and the nations with the Creator. Evidenced earlier, back in August of 1862, when Lincoln learned of the second Bull Run disaster, that day a worried president put pen to paper. He began with, the will of God prevails, and he tried to find a silver lining in one of the darkest chapters of the war. And now, it was a literary springboard for the president's second inaugural address. In 1862, he wrote, the will of God prevails. On the 4th of March, 1865, he uttered, the Almighty has his own purposes. In 1862, he wrote, one must be wrong. God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. In 1865, he used, the prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. Another facet of Lincoln emerges from all this, his religious belief, one that might be best described as fatalistic that whatever happens is bound to happen. Thus the admission he was controlled by events. In his own life, he lost his mother when he was nine, his 21-year-old sister, Sally, and his first love, Anne Rutledge, when she was only 26. His son, Edward, died in 1850, and son, Willie, in 1862. Now, Amidst all the mortality of war, he was the so-called father of a nation torn apart by civil strife. Perhaps that propelled him to use biblical passages in this third paragraph. With the third biblical passage in the paragraph, Matthew chapter 18, verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Lincoln began to shift yet again his message. He used scripture to begin an indictment of slavery and charged not only the South, but the American people, North and South. Thus, the use of the phrase American slavery, not Southern. As his speech moved on near the end of the third paragraph, the line, every drop of blood with the lash shall be paid by another drawn by the sword, It was a rhetorical move that was unexpected. Lincoln asked his audience in the nation to acknowledge that there was an evil in their midst, slavery. Abolitionists blamed the South, but Lincoln chastised the nation. It was about this juncture in his address that Lincoln's prose began to read almost like poetry. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray. The language metrical, more emotional, as he hoped to drive home his message. War had been a necessary means to rid the land of its national sin. And again, he chose to use scripture. 
from Psalms 19.9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With three paragraphs carefully constructed, now Mr. Lincoln moved to his conclusion, from past to the future, from judgment to hope. His last paragraph began with unquestionably the most quoted phrase in Lincoln's second inaugural address, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right. Those first eight words, poetic, timeless, a promise of reconciliation. By adding with firmness in the right, Mr. Lincoln used another of his favorite writing tactics, parallel arrangement, three withs. They offered poetic balance, poetic meter. He now asked the country to enter a new era, armed not with anger or bitterness, but forgiveness. By this time, Lincoln had probably been speaking five to five and a half minutes. Many may well have been expecting plans and policy for Reconstruction, but in an address filled with surprises, he now asked his audience to overcome the barriers of race, of sectionalism, and reunite in peace and forgiveness. His concluding paragraph, one long and complex sentence. Here is that fourth paragraph. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Seventy-five words, six commas, four semicolons, and one dash. Set before a grammar teacher, this sentence and its author would be ripped apart. A quick aside, Mr. Lincoln's use of punctuation was for his ear, for his delivery, pauses and inflection. This final paragraph, set up by the first three, prepped Lincoln's audience, his congregation, if you will, for his conclusion. Like a minister, Lincoln asked his flock to finish the work, to bind up, to care for. Once completed, there were observers that noted that some citizens were just arriving. They missed the 703 words, the 25 sentences organized within four paragraphs, the 505 one-syllable words. Alas, they missed what he believed was his best. As he finished, artillery boomed and the crowd cheered. The president bowed. Chief Justice Salmon Chase rose from his seat and prepared to administer the oath. The clerk of the Superior Court handed the Chief Justice a Bible. Lincoln placed his hand upon the opened holy book, repeated the oath of office, and finished with an emphatic, So help me God! With that, Mr. Lincoln bent down and kissed the Bible. Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration concluded at 12.17 p.m. He now headed for the basement entrance to the Capitol, where a carriage awaited. His son, Tad, scrambled in with him. As they rode back to the executive mansion, well-wishers lined the avenue. Back at the Capitol, the crowd began to disperse. One was John Wilkes Booth who earlier was so close that he told one of his friends, What an excellent chance I had to kill the president if I had wanted on Inauguration Day. I was on the stand so close to him nearly as I am to you. His astonished friend blurted, You're crazy, John. What good would that do? And Booth answered, I could live in history. We are told by people who attended that Lincoln's address produced only intermittent applause. But amongst the crowd, in large numbers, blacks were heard to proclaim at the end of each sentence, Bless the Lord. On March 15th, Mr. Lincoln wrote to New York Republican Thurlow Weed, 
I do expect the address to wear as well, perhaps better than anything I have produced, but I believe it is not immediately popular. To former Secretary of War Simon Cameron, a Pennsylvanian wrote, Lincoln's inaugural, while the sentiments are noble, is one of the most awkwardly expressed documents I have ever read. Another wrote, when he knew it would be read by millions all over the world, why under heavens did he not make it a little more credible to American scholarship? Why could not Mr. Seward have prepared the inaugural so as to save it from the ridicule of a sophomore in a British university? Conversely, from the great-grandson of John Adams and grandson of John Quincy Adams, 29-year-old Charles Francis Adams Jr. wrote to his father in England, that rail-splitting lawyer is one of the wonders of the day. And samplings from the some 2,500 daily and weekly newspapers from around the country at that time, indeed more newspapers than the rest of the world combined, as you might imagine, their reaction? Mixed. The usually friendly New York Times was nonplussed. They wrote, he makes no boast of what he has done or promises of what he will do. The New York Herald was disappointed. Lincoln said nothing about recent events, nothing about topics like the Mexican question, Napoleon, Maximilian, or the Monroe Doctrine. From the New York World, it is with a blush of shame and wounded pride as Americans that we lay before our readers today the inaugural address of President Lincoln and Vice President Johnson. An opponent to the Emancipation Proclamation, the Chicago Times proclaimed, We did not conceive it possible that even Mr. Lincoln could produce a paper so slipshod, so loose-jointed, so puerile, not alone in literary contribution, but in its ideas, its sentiments, its grasp. Differing from the New York and Chicago papers, the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote, the address is characteristic of Mr. Lincoln. It exhibits afresh the kindness of his heart and the large charity which has ever marked his actions toward those who are his personal as well as enemies of his country. Down in the Confederate capital of Richmond, the Richmond Examiner took issue, as many did, of Lincoln's mix of politics and religion. They wrote, it reads like the tale of some old sermon and seems to have no particular meaning of any kind. On the night of March 4, 1865, some 2,000 waited for the doors to open for the inaugural gala to be held at the executive mansion. At 8 p.m., the free-for-all began. In the East Room, the president, looking slightly ill, prepared to shake hands with more than 6,000 who would attend throughout the evening. One man in particular wanted to enter and shake Mr. Lincoln's hand. It was Frederick Douglass, who thought the ceremony earlier that day was, as he put it, wonderfully quiet, earnest, and solemn, and that Lincoln's address sounded more like a sermon than a state paper. As Douglass reached the doors, he was blocked and told that persons of color were not to be permitted. He blurted that he knew the president could not have possibly issued such an order. Guards and Douglas bickered, and their encounter clogged the entrance. One guard ushered Douglas in, simply to clear the narrow passage, and Douglas immediately figured out that he was being ushered out via an exit and asked a guest if he would let the president know he was there. Made aware of the social reformer's presence, president asked that he might be escorted into the East Room. When Douglas finally approached, Lincoln stopped shaking hands and greeted his visitor warmly. Here comes my friend Douglas. I am grateful to see you. I saw you in the crowd today, listening to my inaugural address. How did you like it? Douglas did not want to interrupt the long line of well-wishers, but the president insisted. Douglas paused and gave an answer that came straight from his head and heart. Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. Indeed it was. 
one that American historians generally agree, the greatest in our nation's history. Forty-two days after Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration, he was gone. With his passing, his address back on March the 4th became, if you will, his last will and testament for this country. On April the 15th, only hours after the president died, a public memorial service was held at the Rochester City Hall. Amongst the assembled crowd, Frederick Douglass took a seat near the back of the auditorium. Not included in the list of speakers, he sat, listened, and mourned. After the last scheduled speaker finished, first one, then others, called for Douglas to come forward. He rose and moved to the speaker's platform. Among his many memories, he recalled in particular Lincoln's second inaugural address. Before the assembled, he said, those memorable words, words which will live immortal in history and be read with increasing admiration from age to age. Delivered on the first Saturday in March 1865, just when the sun broke through the clouds, Lincoln's message symbolically offered light and hope for those generations that would begin the process of reunification process of healing, a timeless message we could use even today in these troubled and polarized times. For further reading, I heartedly recommend Ronald C. White Jr.'s Lincoln's Greatest Speech, the Second Inaugural, which was published in 2002 and without it this talk would not have been possible. When we next gather, we'll take you down to southwestern Tennessee at a place by the river that bears the volunteer state's name. A place where in April of 1862, amidst peach blossoms and the promise of spring, there was a harvest of terror and death. We'll put you shoulder to shoulder in the rank and file for the two-day engagement that forever ripped away any veil of innocence this nation might have held about a quick war and the glory of battle. Next time, I hope you'll join us as we take you down the Tennessee to Shiloh. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.